Nice to be with you all. I had a, uh, I had something I wanted to go over today. I think you guys might find interesting. Let's get that door, Mason. Um, well, there is, the video, black, the video died. It just shows a black square on your end. Okay, we're going to figure that out. Thanks, Mason. Um, okay, we're up and running. There you go. There's something called the Brahma Vihar from Buddhism. The Brahma Vihar. Vihar in, in Sanskrit means uh, play. Walking around and, and playing, enjoying. Sometimes Krishna's called Braj Bihari. He's the enjoyer of the land of Braja. Or he's called Bana Bihari, the enjoyer of the forest. Bana means forest. Um, and so you find that the word Bihari used to mean enjoyer or uh, pleasure. It's also used in Buddhism. Um, so much of Buddhism and their language is it's kind of a, a natural form of Sanskrit, what might also be called a bastardized form of Sanskrit, um, called Pali. And so you find Sanskrit's a very formal language. And then Prakrit was, uh, it's, it's a different language, but so much of the words cross over. It was the language that was actually spoken by people. Sanskrit also was spoken but it's, it's much more of a formal language, and Prakrit was much more of a natural colloquial language. Anyway, Pali comes uh, from Prakrit, but it also has a lot of words that are just the same as Sanskrit because the languages overlap so much and were uh, concurrent with each other. So the word Bihar is used in, in Pali and in Buddhism to refer to temples. So Buddhist temples are oftentimes called Bihars because the Buddhist monks would walk around and meditate on the grounds and they would just kind of you know, wander around and meditate. So it was a place of walking or enjoying. So Brahma Bihar, like literally it will translate as the abode of Brahman or the abode of spirit. Um, a lot of times you like to think of Buddhism as being a distinct religion from Hinduism, but you know, the last chapter of the Dhammapada is called, Who is a Brahmana? And so Buddha was trying to communicate to his followers that, you know, I'm a real Brahmana. Brahmana means priest. And so Buddhism was a, largely a, a schism, a break off from Hinduism. And so much of what they did was they contrasted their teachings to the teachings of the orthodoxy. And so they would, they, would, they, would, uh, they would say, you know, those aren't the real brahmanas. We're the real brahmanas. So they would take the language of the Vedas and they would weaponize it and co-opt it and use it against the people they were critiquing. Forgive me, but there's just, the movement is getting to me. It's hard for me to like, because you're on your phone and stuff. It's like, I'm having a hard time just keeping my train of thought. Um, especially when I'm trying to teach something academic like this, it's really hard for me to keep my train of thought when there's a lot of movement going on. So I'm just going to start again. Forgive me. But it's important for me as I'm speaking that I feel like I'm making sense. Um, we're going to look over this thing called the Brahma Viharas. And Brahma means spirit in Sanskrit. And that term Brahma was co-opted by the Buddhists. And they tried to say, you know, we're the masters of spirit. We know spirit. You don't know spirit. We know spirit. You could imagine, you know, like the word um, um, republic. Republic means for the public. 
or by the public. And so if you're a republic, it means you are a community or a country which is governed by the people and for the people. And that's a republic. You follow? So you could imagine some Democrats, they could say, we're the real Republicans. You guys think you're the Republicans, but we're the real Republicans because we're actually representing the people. Did you follow that? So sometimes you might get this two sides are arguing with each other, and one of them will use the language of the other side, like Catholic. The word Catholic in, in, in Latin means? Who said that? Universal. That's right, it means universal. So there's, a, there's another church with hundreds of millions of people called the Orthodox Church. Orthodox means? Proper belief. Doxos means belief, and ortho means correct, like an orthodontist corrects your teeth, or an orthopedist. So, um, um, the Orthodox Church to this day <clears throat> refuses to call the Catholics Catholics. They say, you're not the universal church, we are. They call themselves Catholics. And they refuse to grant that title to the Western Church, the Catholic Church based in Rome. Their church was traditionally from Istanbul. It was the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church, the church I grew up in, refuses to call the Catholics Catholics because it would be granting that they're the universal church. You follow? And in reciprocity, the Catholic Church refuses to call the Orthodox Church Orthodox. They call themselves the Catholic Orthodox Church because they believe they have the correct beliefs. Are you guys following this? So, Brahma is a Sanskrit term, but it shows up in Buddhist literature. So the Brahma Viharas are these four, they're also called the Apramans, the four immeasurables. Praman, one meaning of Praman is to measure, or to prove something. Upraman means it can't be measured. It's just so important. It's such an important thing. It can't be, can't be uh, um, overly stressed. So they have four things they think are critical. And those four things are mudita, joy, and uh, karuna, or mercy, Maitri, friendship, and upeksha. Upeksha means uh, it means ignoring. Literally, is what it means. Overlooking somebody and not giving them attention. And so, in in Pali, it becomes upeksha, upeksha. Iksh means to see. And so in Pali it becomes upeka. But the words change a little bit. So uh, mitta is for maitri and upeka is for upeksha. It's like a simple word. It's like, you know, instead of saying do not, you'll say don't. In the Pali language, the Buddhist language, they kind of shorten the words and make them easy to pronounce. So these things are important in Buddhism. They show up in any number of early Buddhist texts. Maitri, Karuna, Mudita, and Upeksha. Or friendship, mercy, joy, and ignoring. They're seen to be these invaluable, immeasurably valuable instructions. And if you can follow these, then you are moving with divinity. You're living in divinity. You're partaking in divinity. Now these things are, are so old, they go back to before Buddha. He didn't make these things up. He borrowed them from the pre-existing tradition. So did the Jains. 
the Jains, which are a very old religion in India as well. I don't want to get into it in too much detail, but a very old religion in India. Um, small, but they've been around for a long, long time, from before Buddha. And it's a, a tradition of renunciates. And so the Jains have these four things, and Buddhists have these four things, and these four things show up in Hinduism as well. And so these four items are considered to be critical and foundational in all the major strains of Eastern spirituality that grew out of India, namely Jain Dharma, Buddhism, uh, and, uh, and Hinduism. Did you guys follow this? It's, you know, a lot of times you'll look at something, you'll find something in Islam, then you'll find something else in Christianity, then you'll find something else in Buddhism. But sometimes you might find something that exists in all three traditions. And they all say how valuable it is and how essential it is. And it really represents the, 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 the global spirituality or the, the regional spirituality of a group of people spanning, you know, thousands of years. You guys follow this? This is that. This even shows up in the Yoga Sutras. It even shows up in the Yoga Sutras. Now, in the Yoga Sutras, you get a little bit more. There's a little more to it. In the Yoga Sutras, it's... Uh, Maitri Karuna Mudita Upekshanam Sukha Dukha Punya Apunya Vishayan Bhavanatas Chitta Prasadanam <clears throat> Your mind becomes peaceful. Chitta means mind. Prasadana means peaceful. Prasad we usually think of as meaning like something which comes off the altar is called prasad, but the word Prasad, literally in Sanskrit, means tranquil or peaceful. So chitta prasadnam, your mind becomes tranquil and peaceful. When you adopt an attitude of maitri karuna mudita upekshana, these four things I just mentioned, friendship, mercy, joy, and ignoring, towards Sukha, dukkha, punya, apunya. Towards these four things. Sukha means happy people. Dukkha means sad people. So you should be friendly with happy people. You should be merciful or kind or compassionate to sad people. You should feel joyous when you interact with pious people, punya, purified people. And you should ignore apunya. You should ignore impious people. So whereas the four things are mentioned in Buddhism, was it Thich Nhat Hanh? Is that, is that how you pronounce his name? Thich Nhat Hanh, right? That's how you say it. Okay, just, want, just making sure. He talks about these things. It's like, that's, they're, like they're even in like Neo-Buddhism. They're like, they're like up until today, that's how popular they are. They go back to... They go back to, you know, as far back as anybody can trace because you find them in every tradition. Everybody says they're the origin of them. But it, but it definitely goes back to pre-Buddhism. So, you find them in the Yoga Sutras. They're in the Yoga Sutras. They're in the Upanishads as well. And so, it's interesting the way they show up in the Yoga Sutras. They match up the four things with four types of people. That's an important evolution. So now it's not just four things you cultivate, and you have to figure out sort of what to do with them. What do you ignore? What do you feel joy about? <laughs> right? You know, what, what is mercy? Like, when, when, you, when you deploy these different things, and they do appear to some extent to be contradictory also. Like ignoring or being indifferent to something and then being joyful seem to be somewhat at odds. <laughs> Don't they? <laughs> You know, and, 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 yeah, and so you know, maybe friendship and compassion 
maybe you can, those, those are easier to, to put together. But you know, when do you deploy these different things? What exactly do they mean? The Yoga Sutras give us a little more. They match up the four qualities with four kinds of people. So you feel joyful when you see who? Happy people. Huh? Happy people. That's right. You feel joyful when you see pious people. There you go. And then you feel friendship when you see happy people. And when you see sad people, what do you feel? All right. And then finally, when you interact with impious people, what do you do? You ignore them. It becomes much more prescriptive, isn't it? It becomes like an injunction you can follow. Interestingly, interestingly, um, when you look at empathy and sympathy and compassion and pity, pity is when you feel bad when you see somebody suffer, but that's about it. And then sympathy is when you, you feel with them, like you want to do something to help them, but you might not know what they need. And empathy is feeling into them, meaning you put yourself in their shoes and you think about and you experience what they're experiencing. But you may not want to help them, you may just want to understand them for some reason. Like a con man could want to understand you to exploit you. And then compassion is when you, you suffer with somebody. Passion means suffering. The word entered the English language to refer to the passion of the Christ, the suffering of Christ. So its original usage in English was to indicate the suffering of Christ. And so compassion is when you suffer with somebody. And that's usually thought of as you put sympathy, the desire to help somebody, together with empathy, knowing what they need, and you deploy that, that's called compassion. Then compassion by different thinkers, it's like you be compassionate towards your family, towards your community, or towards globally, towards everybody. And then you also have heroic compassion, where you put yourself in harm's way. And you can have heroic compassion for your family or for strangers. And there's all these you know, different types that you can get into it and really kind of dissect it and figure out all the different kinds of feelings that people have and, and how to categorize them and taxonomize them and take something which is usually very difficult to wrap your head around and really understand it. So some theorists, some positive psychologists, some people that get into positive human emotion and defining it, they, uh, they make the point that really uh, compassion is just love towards someone who's suffering. Did you follow this? It's just love, but somebody's suffering, and so you love them by helping them. You guys followed that, right? The same thing is done by Buddhists and by um, Hindu pundits. They make the same exact point. They say these four emotions are a basic emotion of spirituality, which is then deployed and takes different forms depending on who you're interacting with. So the proper thing to do if you love somebody who is envious or impious, the proper thing to do is to leave them alone. Because if you interact with them, what will happen? They'll become more disturbed. You follow this? And the proper thing, if you meet somebody who's suffering, is to, like the, the way you show love for someone who's suffering, but receptive, is you give them mercy and compassion. And so a lot of efforts made to made on the part of Buddhist and also Hindu thinkers over long periods of time. I found Thich Nhat Hanh making the same point, but I also found old Hindu pundits making the same point thousands of years ago when com commentating on texts. And they make the point that it's the same basic spiritual emotion and it's, it takes different shape depending on who it's touching. But from your side, it's the same emotion. Therefore, there's equanimity. Therefore, there's 
equalness. Therefore, there's a universal love. They want to avoid the idea that spirituals play favorites. And so they give examples. Now, what I want to talk about today was how these same four ideas show up in our core text, the Srimad Bhagavatam. See if you can spot the difference. Ishwade tat adhineshu bali shesu dvishatsu cha prema maitri karuna upeksha yakaruti samadhyama. The middle devotee, the intermediate devotee. Not the beginner devotee and not the most advanced devotee. And we'll discuss those some other day. But the intermediate devotee, Yakaroti, one who does this, Samadhyama, he's a Madhyam. And it's, it's, it's in reference to a Madhyam practitioner or a middle practitioner of Bhakti Yoga, of Bhakti. So it's about a Bhakta. That Bhakta who's intermediate, who's become accomplished, he offers prema to Ishwar, to God. He loves God. Tat adine shu. And to those who are attached to God, he offers friendship. Balisheshu. To those who are foolish and young. Balisha means young. It also means ignorant, foolish. To those who are foolish or young or immature, the Madhyama offers karuna, compassion. Dvishatsu, and to those who are dvisha, dvisha means hateful, the Madhyama offers neglect, pious neglect, upeksha. To the Lord, the Madhyama, the middle devotee, offers love. To those attached to the Lord, tat adhineshu means to those who are subordinate to that, means the devotees who are like subordinate to Krishna. Then he offers friendship. To those who are foolish, they offer compassion. And to those who are hateful, they offer pious neglect. Did you guys spot an evolution or a difference in the Bhagavad's version? compared to the Yoga Sutras, compared to Buddhism. Buddhism is just, it just says the four. Here's the four. You've got to figure out what to do with them. The Yoga Sutras say the four, and they match them up with four kinds of people. Did you guys spot what the Bhagavad does differently? I'm pretty worried, because I think I did a good job of articulating the difference. Yeah. Puts it in reference to the Lord. Yeah, does do that. That's one thing. Okay, that's good. We're off to the races. That was not a fail. What else? The word mudita, joy, was replaced by prema or love. And love is offered to Krishna. There's something special about Krishna and you love Krishna. It's theistic. Why are you nodding your head? You didn't raise your hand. You don't get to nod your head. I gave this to you and I just asked you to repeat it to me. I just needed like a little bit of reading, a little bit of comprehension and like a little bit of like valor and I got neither from you guys. And so I'm disappointed. So there's the Lord has been introduced. It's not in reference to the Lord's actually introduced as a category, a person that you interact with. And the Lord is fit for your love. So the whole thing of giving joy to the pious is gone. You follow? Or giving French, French to the pious is actually still there. Giving joy to the happy is gone. Now you're giving love to Krishna. And instead of giving your happiness uh, or your friendship to the pious, you're giving your friendship to who, Griffin? You're killing me, guys. I mean, I realize it's like not 
2 plus 2 equals 4, but I'm really moving slow. I'm moving super slow. You weren't paying attention. I was like 2 plus 2 equals, and you got it wrong. You weren't paying attention. It's okay. Yeah? You already spoke. Yeah? Yeah. We've introduced two new categories of people. Krishna and the devotees. You see how it's evolved and it's a little different? Instead of being a generic instruction for a spiritualist, it becomes an instruction for a devotee in interacting with the Lord and the devotees. It becomes a way to navigate the society of Vaishnavas. And so previously you felt joy when you found happy people. Now, now you find love when you see Krishna. Previously you found friendship when you met pious people. Now you find friendship when you meet fellow devotees. The same thing, the ignorant or the unhappy, they get your mercy and you avoid the hateful. And our commentators, they explain, if you go and try to share our spiritual tradition with hateful people, they'll become even more envious. And either they'll contaminate you, or even if they don't contaminate you, they'll become worse off. They're in such a bad place that if you touch them, they'll get worse. They don't have the ability to therapeutically engage with the community of devotees. Have you ever met people like this? Don't just nod your head. Think about it. Have you ever met people that if you talk to them about spirituality, about your value system, they'll become hateful and they'll, they become angry, even violent, and they become critical? Have you ever met people like that? Yeah. Right? You, you might have to be a little older, like us, but yeah. at a certain point you've met people like this, and the only thing you can do is just let them go. They don't have the ability to interface therapeutically with the community devotees. Their ego's too big, their impiety's too big, their anger's too big, whatever it is, they've got something and it stops them from sliding into and interfacing with the association devotees in a way that gives them value. And so they just have to be kept at arm's length. You can't give them too much. our commentators make this point. They take the whole idea, this very, very old idea, and they streamline it, and they explain the same principle, that really the devotee loves everybody, but that love has to be manifested differently depending on who the devotee is dealing with. Do you guys follow this? So, there's more, but we move too slow. So I'm going to have to wrap it up here. I'd really like it if you guys could bring your A-game next time so we can move through stuff and get somewhere quickly. I know it's hard to pay attention. I have a hard time paying attention, but let's try. So just to recap, there's this old idea. It's called the Brahma Vihar. It's thousands of years old. You find it in Jainism, Buddhism, and in Hinduism. That's not very common. It's not, this isn't the only one. There's other ideas. But that's pretty far out. I mean, even the idea of an Atma isn't there in Buddhism. You know what I mean? It's like the idea of a deity isn't there in Jainism or Buddhism. So like, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of areas where these Eastern spiritual groups differ on substantial items. But somehow they all decide that this is the way a spiritualist moves through the world. In early Buddhism, you just get the four ideals. In the Yoga Sutras, the four ideals, friendship, compassion, joy, and neglect, are matched up with four kinds of people. And so you're friendly with the pious, you neglect the impious, you feel joy when you see happy people, and you, and you feel compassion and act on it when you see suffering people. But then in the Bhagavatam, which may be the oldest version for all we know, but in the Bhagavatam, it's conceived of totally differently it's been surgically applied to our theistic tradition. And now Krishna gets your love. The devotees get your friendship. 
the innocent get your mercy and the hateful people get your neglect. And that's actually the mark of an advancing devotee, where they can properly interface with people in a way that makes the best out of whatever situation they're in. I personally find this fascinating because you see this kind of like over thousands of years, this same idea staying alive in different traditions, which have so much out of common, but somehow they all agree this is the way to live. You follow this? And it's really, it's about virtue. It, it, it represents the evolution of a religion. In the beginning of a religion, like in the Jewish religion, it was a sacrificial cult. You like, you sacrificed things. You followed rules. You like, you, you said incantations. You sacrificed animals. You followed like, you know, certain rites of passage. It's, it's, it's a low form of religion, a heavy ritualization of religion. It requires actually very little faith. It just requires obedience and fear. But then as you go along in a tradition and the tradition grows up, or maybe it's always, always grown up, but as you evolve, you can start to appreciate the virtue of a tradition. Virtuous conduct, acting with integrity. And it becomes less about this or that ritual, and it becomes more about the way you live your life. And your whole life becomes a living ritual. And in, in, in that evolution of spirituality, you find ideas like these four immeasurables, these Brahma Viharas, these symptoms of an intermediate devotee, they become incredibly important because they're what serious people who've gotten over the fear-based religion, who've gotten over the mere ritual for material benefits, the way they start to think and what they start to value and the way they start to move. It's an evolution. You find it all over ancient Indian spirituality even in competing traditions. And in the Bhagavatam, it becomes really beautiful and elegant and mixed with spirituality and mixed with devotion and mixed with Krishna Bhakti. And you get this wonderful version of these four items that's just perfectly tailor-made for a bhakta. There might be people you can't spend time with because they'll contaminate you. And then when they don't, can't contaminate you anymore, you might still not spend time with them because they'll just become more offensive. And you just got to let certain people go. Let them cook for a while. Learn the hard way. And we need to make sure that we're not so egotistical and so proud and so hateful that, 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 that we can't interface therapeutically with society devotees. Otherwise, you find yourself on the outs. We shouldn't think that we're more advanced because we rush in where, where, where angels fear to tread and we jump in and you know, share the gospel with people uh, clumsily in a way that actually makes them less favorable towards our tradition because we don't know how to administer it and how to give medicine properly. It's really chastening. It kind of shows you something of the depth of a spiritual tradition. And you can spend time with these verses and these virtues and meditate on them and, and apply them in your life, and there's great value. And so although we have a tradition that teaches you to be tolerant like a tree, to give all respect but to expect none in return, it doesn't mean that that respecting everybody is always, that it always looks the same. You might have the same love to give. And you have to. But if you really care about people, you'll look at where they're at and you will apply your love differently. And this even extends to Krishna, who sometimes gives us a wide berth so we can learn the lessons we need to learn and keeps us at arm's length. Arm's length. When you take second initiation in our tradition, when you become ordained as a Brahmin, it's the second of the, of, of, the, of the three initiations we take. It's called upanayanam. It means the guru brings you close to his eye. Upaniti, he brings you close to him. Prior to that, it's maryada. It's etiquette, keeps you away. So you don't make offenses. And at a certain point, you become qualified and you, you're brought close. It's called upaniti to be brought close. Upeksha, to overlook. Upaniti, to be brought close. Same word upas used. 
It means over with one, and it means close in the other. You, the, 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 the prefix use, has both meanings to it, depending on the context. And so we get brought close when we can be close without becoming offensive. Otherwise, that mercy is to keep people at arm's length and let them just purify themselves gradually. You follow this? We find this kind of like all over our tradition. Upanishad. Upa, same word, upa, means close. Ni means down. Shud, like prashad, means to sit. That's when the guru tells you, sit down close to me. I'm going to teach you. This whole push and pull. Who's kept away? Who's brought close? How close are you brought? And I guess the last thing I'll say is this. Um, uh, Clive Lewis, who's, who's known as, as C.S. Lewis. His first name is Clive. He's a very, very famous author. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia and, and other books as well. Um, he, he one time said that lo- there is no love without vulnerability. He went on about it. He said, like, you know, if you never want to risk being hurt, then don't love anybody. Lock your heart away in a coffin and watch it change and become unlovable and untouchable and unmovable. But anytime you love somebody, that love, that caring about the person, relativizes you to some extent as you open up and become receptive to them. You guys following this? And so really it's like, both for your benefit and for the benefit of the people you interact with, being able to gradually come closer together and also being able to create distance that can actually be a sign of love. Because if you bring somebody too close too fast, they're going to mess themselves up, they're going to mess you up, they're going to spoil the whole thing. We see this in the way Krishna relates to us, and then as we become more spiritualized, we should relate to each other in a similar way, and we should start to refine the way we interact with the world. And we should learn this lost art of being very surgical and loving people, sometimes from a distance. Bringing them a little closer, that's enough. A little closer still. And we want that with Krishna. Eventually we want to be close to Krishna. Krishna himself says, like, I'll give you mukti very easily. Prem I don't give so easily. Because prem is Krishna vashayad controls Krishna. Krishna, uh, love obliges Krishna, brings you so close to Krishna, you embrace Krishna, you have intimacy with Krishna. Such a concept of divinity as being intimately available is almost impossible to think of. We generally don't think of God like this. We think of God as being the one without a second and immovable and always full in himself and not depending on us for anything. But a deity like that would be, like in C.S. Lewis's terms, incapable of love, incapable of intimacy. There is no love without intimacy, even from Krishna towards us. That's why Krishna becomes bound by Yashoda. That's why Krishna becomes a child dependent on his mother, sucking her bosom. The whole idea of our conception of divinity is this idea of ever increasingly intimate relationships that are possible with God. That require further and further levels of excellence on our part so we don't mess things up like a bull in a china shop. And we similarly find that ontology or that understanding of the relationship between the soul and God reflected in the relationship between the soul and this world. And we're basically given the same task of learning how to expertly interface with people in a therapeutic way, even when sometimes that means keeping them away. Anyway, we've been kept away from each other for some time. And now with the lessening of COVID, Things dropping down, cases plummeting. We're starting to do programs inside. And so let's be very careful with each other. Let's wear masks. 
and let's stand at some distance. Let's do kirtan, and let's kind of slowly come back together in a way that preserves our health. And we should also think that this time of separation should have made the heart grow fonder, and we should learn to take the temple less for granted, and we should learn the art of therapeutically and like strongly taking the benefit that a sacred place like this has, that a vihar like this has, to use the Buddhist terminology. And we should learn to um, never again take it for granted and always take full advantage of it in this short lifetime and this miraculous opportunity we have to participate in, in the wonderful tradition of Krishna consciousness. Okay, that's it. I'm all done. Thank you very much. Adi Bhavan.